Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, I have the pleasure of introducing our speaker, Judy Hissong. Um, very impressive. Um, I'll share a few things from her bio. Uh, she is the president of MISO Strategies. Um, Judy's actually a former um, law firm chief of operating officer, so she advises routinely uh, leadership on uh, strategic and other leadership development. Um, she speaks, uh, trains, and consults on a regular basis, um, but she also teaches, uh, teaches a quarterly online webinar um, with, and, and facilitates Leaders Lab, or Leaders, yeah, Leaders Lab, I believe, is, is what I saw in your, in your bio, G, um, yep. which is a monthly video conference that enables small groups of leaders um, to brainstorm you know, strategies and solutions. What, one of the things um, that really caught me with her bio, and I wanted to, to, to leave you all with this while when we bring Judy on, is that she says her mission is world domination for good. Um, so I don't think you could say that any better. So I will turn things over to Judy. And Judy, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks for the introduction, Pam. I, I feel compelled to, to further that for a second and say what I mean by world domination for good is that I intend to leave you with one or two things today that you will want to share with someone else. And as you share it with someone else and you build it into your life, we make the world a better place one person at a time. And that's what world domination for good means in case you were thinking that there was some other plot to overtake the world. Um, point of clarity. Thank you all. Thank you, SLW, for having me. Thank you all for being here today on this really important topic of belonging. Now, we've named this about minding your business, and that has all kinds of connotations, including some pop culture reference of minding your business, and then additionally, minding your business of the law firm. That is intended. We're going to cover a lot of ground. I'm hoping we're going to play a little bit. We're going to practice a little bit, and we're going to learn a little bit. That's the goal here. A couple of things to start with. Um, in 2020, Deloitte did a study of organizations about what would be really important to them for their success over the next 18 months. Now, uh, I, I chose this study on purpose because it was done in the early, in the first quarter of 2020. And boy, what a year it was after that, right? But here's the interesting thing. So 78% of organizations said that fostering a sense of belonging was either important or very important to their success over the next 18 months. And then 13% of them said, we're actually ready to do that. So it's quite a contrast and it speaks to the complexity of our conversation today. Belonging is a very um, multifaceted event. In fact, before you all joined us today, Pam and I were talking about the benefits of being uh, in a hybrid environment, the benefits of being in a remote environment, the benefits of being in an office environment, and how some of that sense of belonging was really enhanced by people who were working solo, part of a bigger organization working solo in their market. And what that really meant was, I'm going to work from home because my home has been my office and is my office. And so when people like Judy Hisson come to speak to us, I'm relegated to a screen where the majority of people are in a room. And what that did for me over time was maybe I had some audio issues or some video issues or something like this. And, and Pam and I are talking about it, but I'm really talking about it from a much larger perspective. This is not a one person issue. This is happening. I hear it all the time. It's so much better for me because now that we do things via webinar, I get to participate as fully as everybody else. And that my friends, is a sense of belonging, one small example. So coming back to this Deloitte study, I thought it was really interesting to say we're 13% of us are ready to foster a sense of belonging. Well, why not 100% ready? I mean, saying you're ready, you haven't done anything yet, right? So, so that speaks to our nervousness and our fears around it a little bit. Now let's contrast that with the 2022 study done by Gallup. And this one was more focused, Gallup focuses more on employees, Deloitte focuses more on employers, and we are all of the above for a lot of us, right? So in 2022, Gallup study said, show 42% of the United States employees say a diverse and inclusive employer is really, really important to them. And 
one way we create that kind of environment is through things like the SLW Academy, where we know we want to attract diverse candidates to create a more inclusive and belonging firm. Well, to attract diverse candidates, we have to expose people to what the heck patent law is. Ta-da, the SLW Academy is born. And now we have the opportunity to say, hey, you're in career choice. You haven't picked career path, or maybe you think you have career path and you don't like it. The SLW Academy is a great way to move from there. And no, we haven't advanced the slides yet. So you're okay, it hasn't frozen. I haven't moved it. I'm still talking. Yes. So thinking about this notion, 42% want to be part of a diverse workforce. That's step one. That's step one. How do we get there? So I think it's important to distinguish between nouns and verbs. And I say this all the time. I think it's really important to consider leadership as a verb, not a noun. Now I realize I just stepped on everybody's grammar everywhere. So let me say it differently. When I act as a leader in a titled role, that's a noun. What I really want to be thinking about, yes, I'll send you links to the studies later, Shireen, making a note. Um, what I really want you to be thinking about is you as leaders, you're a verb, you're always in motion. You're thinking about how do we move things forward? So when we talk about diversity, which is now almost passe in this discussion, diversity is about the difference. And, and, and that's that's above the waterline, right? That, that's how I see things differently. Diverse teams are more important than diverse companies be, because it's inside the teams that build the company. When we talk about inclusion, we talk about you're invited to the dance, that's the common way that's said. What that really means is we're listening and expecting you to contribute. So you know, you all go to that meeting, you go to that class, you go where you go, you're sitting in there. How often are you thinking, just don't call on me, just don't call on me, just don't call on me. That inclusion piece is that expectation that everybody will contribute. It's much more active, right? Turns into a verb. Now, when we talk about belonging, we're talking about moving from your head to your heart. This is simple stuff. I feel sense of belonging, which is why only 13% of those organizations feel ready. Because belonging isn't a statistic, it isn't a number. It's much more about the contribution I feel. Again, back to the conversation Pam and I are having before the rest of you got here. You know, when I'm able to participate as fully as everybody else, I feel a greater connection to my colleagues and feeling that greater connection is terrific. We can all admit that. What we're really talking about is creating a culture of belonging that's gonna have diversity in it. It's gonna have inclusion in it. To create that culture, there are three components. I wanna feel respected, I wanna feel welcomed and I wanna feel valued. That's it. Now those are big words and what do they really mean? Respect me, appreciate my contributions, appreciate what I'm doing, appreciate what I'm thinking, all of the above. Welcome me, genuine desire, genuine desire to have a meaningful relationship with me. And then value me, appreciate that I'm not the same as everybody else. When we get to culture of belonging and the intersection of those three exist, we are an attractor of talent. What are the obstacles to that? That's really the point of the conversation, isn't it? So what a line of visibility here. And I like this graphic. I want you to look at this for a second. What do you personally have? Which of these do you relate to that are below the waterline? Which of these do you have that are above the waterline? that might be challenging. Now, the reason I use this graphic and that I wanna talk about this is because our job in creating a culture of belonging, each of us, each of us that are contributors to that, is to notice and surface as much as we can below the waterline. If I have done any sort of personality assessment or a communication assessment or assessment of any kind, 
How freely do I share that result? And how often do I commit to working on, oh, wow, that's one way of being. What's another way of being? What's another way of being? Again, that's in the leadership space. When we're talking about culture of belonging, me surfacing, my thinking style, my skills, my work style, that helps remove some of those barriers to belonging. So short word for that, vulnerability. Am I willing to be vulnerable with my peers? It's tricky stuff. What does it take? Well, it takes this train. Which way is this train moving? Is it moving toward you? Is it moving away from you? And if it's moving toward you, can you make it move away from you? If it's moving away from you, can you make it move toward you? Now what is this? What are we noticing here with this? Well, this is really about our mindset. This is this is about saying, am I in a situation where my mindset is fixed? Because if I can simply change my thoughts and look at something a little bit differently, look at how it changes the direction of the train. Fascinating, right? Now, I'm not going to leave it up too long because I know it makes people crazy. But this notion of let me check on my mindset first. If I want to create something more, it starts with me and how I relate to it. Let's go back to study. And this one you can find, Shireen. This is McKenzie and Company's study about key drivers why employees leave. And this one is particularly related to belonging and feeling valued at work. And this first slide up here is where we're looking at what's important to employees, more important to employees than employers. And this is in the blue. It's more important that they feel valued by their manager, valued by their organization, have a sense of belonging, potential for advancement, caring and trusting teammates. And then you'll notice also flexible work schedule in here. But let's go to the other four for a second. Caring and trusting teammates, really, really important. Am I part of a team at all? And how, when I am part of a team, particularly in the legal world, have I taken care to create a team? In other words, we tend to be individual contributors in our industry. And so thinking about how people work in a team is completely different. How can I create a sense of belonging among a group of individual contributors? We need common goals. We need common uh, uh, pathways, whether that's workflow, whether that's process improvement, continuous improvement, client work. I mean, we need common pathways. How do I, as a manager, show you that you're valued? How do I, as an employee, ask my manager what my value is? So the fascinating thing to me about this particular graphic is that this is what's important to employees. Now let's look at what's important to employers. This is just from a pure color perspective. And for those of you that might be color challenged or uh, color blind, we got top, we got the top, basically the top quadrant left is employer view of what's missing. In other words, this is what is important to employees. And then down here, employer view of what employers think. And when we look at this quadrant, we notice that there's a lot of things. And those of you that are sitting on the employer side of things, you might hear yourself say this, or you might read this in the press. Compensation, I'll leave for more compensation. I'll leave because I don't have good health. I'll leave because there's a better development opportunity or a better job or a better ability to work remotely or I was poached. And interestingly enough, when you look at that cluster of things, it is really different. There's not much relational component to it as opposed to the employee is almost all relational. This is a big shift in the history of work. And the reason I think this is so important right now is because as we gather into the next generation, right now we've got five generations in the workforce. So we gather into the next generation of us, our legacy, as we say, the sense of belonging is going to guide us. There's another reason. And I think it has to do a lot with the pandemic. Let me start here. So Deloitte studied, and this is a old study. I'm not even sure I could find it. And now I think it's a 2018 study. They studied 1,300 people, which is a really small subset, and I get that part. 
but I was looking for something in particular to the generations that I thought would be relevant to you all today. So this Deloitte study, 1300 people, very small sample size, 80% of them said inclusion was really important. 40% of them said, I will leave if I don't feel there's a sense of inclusion here. And of that, 23% had already left. This is the weight of this stuff at this point in history. Now, 2018, think about where we were. Go back in time, pre-pandemic, right? This is very different. And that's the other slice of this. So we're not, we're talking about pre-George Floyd murder. We're talking about pre-pandemic world, a very different place than it is now. Now, here's the, the crux of this and the reason I think this is most important. 71% of this study said they want inclusive behaviors, not inclusive policy or program. They are looking to see inclusion in practice, not simply as the backstop, which is what I call policy. Policies are backstop. That's what we go and get to make sure we've enforced something. Belonging is not something that sits in policy. It sits in feeling and behavior and relationship every day. It's in that space of if I'm afraid to show up with my whole self at work, what percent of me actually shows up? We know this can, we know that one in four, again, this is 2018, one in four don't feel like they belong at their company. That means they're holding back some portion of their identity. Now, what's the connector? If I want a culture of belonging, I have to be careful I'm tending to my cultural competence. What am I doing with my cultural competence? Now, I mentioned the other piece of the pandemic. And I want to remind us all for a second. This really strange things happen. Strange things happened in our world. And this is, this is so much more. We spent so much time prior to 2020 up here in self-actualization. What can we do to learn and grow ourselves next? And when whatever happened in March of 2020 called COVID happened for you and your world and your market and your economy, wherever you were, we all went right down to the bottom of this table and said, we need to make sure our physiological needs are met. And if you're someone who said, no, 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 I felt fine, I felt fine, then I wanna remind you that anybody who went to the grocery store or anybody who tried to go to, to any of the masks, Costco's and Sam's of the world had a hard time finding toilet paper and beans and rice, things that would provide us the physiological safety because we already had places of shelter. When we think about it in those terms, we start to recognize the significance of safety in a brand new way. Now, there were other layers that happened in a very similar window of time around safety. There was a lot of masking or no masking or mandate or no mandate. And then along the way, George Floyd was murdered. We surfaced some of the other things that were happening inside of our, inside of our country around safety that got new light because wearing a mask was not something a lot of folks had to do prior to this pandemic. And when we think about the sense of belonging and one in four people not bringing their whole selves to work, what that really means is we've got people who've been showing up in masks for years. It just wasn't a physical separate item from us. Really highlighted this desire for safety and security. It also created a lot of plexiglass and a lot of other things that happen in common spaces. And you'll notice what's right above safety is love and belonging. And that sense of belonging, and, and I will say love, where, where we go to work and have people we care deeply for, we have a stronger sense of belonging anyway. Do you have a work bestie? How much time do you spend with your work bestie? probably more time than you spend with some of your other friends by virtue of how many hours we spend at work. The love and belonging component of this has been absent because again, we've been living in the self-actualization for so long. And from what I see, from where I sit in the world, this is still where we're growing. I haven't seen us return yet to esteem. Although I do see and hear a lot about imposter syndrome and confidence, and I'm going to veer slightly off the belonging topic for a second, but not really, because confidence is a huge piece of this. 
Prior to 2020, a lot of our confidence could be found externally. I would come to work. I would see other people. They would tell me I had done great work. I had offered them a great product. They had looked in my eyes while they said that. I was able to connect at that fourth dimension, which is heart to heart when I'm in person. A lot of those things fed me. When I started working entirely remotely, I had to get that differently. And for a large chunk of us, getting that internal confidence was a huge shift. Now, that's not to say you don't have some, I'm sure you do. That is to say that when day in and day out, day in and day out, you're doing the work, you're doing the work, you're doing the work, and your only reward is to say, phew, I finished the work. That's different than what we had before when we were able to go down the hall and say, man, I just finished that such and such, that was really difficult. And somebody could say, I knew you had it. Or that's awesome, tell me more about it. That piece of esteem, that's where we're headed next. So if you're not attached to this belonging topic in the same way as others, cool. Think about where you're at with your esteem. Eventually we will climb back up to self-actualization. I don't know, I suspect minus any other major US related events, might be 2027 when we get there. The world's a wacky place right now. It's a lot at risk in the safety realm for a lot of people. So I don't know, it might still pull us down. Okay, let's move on. I want to talk specifically about things that would help us understand ourselves more deeply and dig into things that are related specific to how we create that culture of belonging. And a big piece of it is to understand there's a lot that runs in the back of our brains, a lot less that runs in the front of our brains. You're unconscious running all the time, running all the time. Um, if I say to you, go, everybody go get in your car and, and drive over right? We're going to have lunch together. Everybody drive over. What's the first thing you'll do when you get into your car? Well, some of you will say, I'll put on my seatbelt. Some of you might say, I'll put the key in. Some of you don't have keys. You'll press a button. And I'll say to you, did you unlock it? And for a lot of us who've been driving for a long time, that subconscious component of habit runs the show and we just know it's going to get unlocked. We don't even think about it. It just happens. So this whole idea of saying, okay, hold on. Let me think about what the strength of associations are that are running behind the scenes and that association between concepts, evaluations, and stereotypes. And, and how do those three things relate together with how I relate to the world? See, our belonging quotient is the ability we all carry to help others feel like they belong. And so when we start measuring this relationship between these associations, we have a sense of what we might be doing to contribute to or against a sense of belonging, sometimes for ourselves. And by the way, a lot of these strengths are societal. So it's not like you walk around with intention to do anything. You've picked them up as you've been fed them. As an example, we know that about a thousand people a day take the implicit association test. And by the way, if you want to go to Google, that's all you need to type in. Here's a link. You can type in implicit association test. You're going to get to this link. About a thousand people a day participate in one or another IET. There are a number of them. Pick one, go do it. All it's doing is tracking how quickly you move between things. And I'm going to give you a small sample one in just a second. Here's a couple of interesting things that have come out of various IETs over the years. One of the IATs was to, to measure the strength of association between men and women in the workplace. So the concept of who belongs at work, the evaluation of it, is it better for men or women, along with any stereotypes around that. So 1,000 people a day, take it. 71% of the men who took this particular IAT said men should have the career and women should have the family. That should be their primary roles. Okay, I'm not judging it, I'm noticing it. That's an interesting statistic. All right, maybe you say, of course, of course. Well, here's the other side of that. 77% of the women who took this particular IAT said men should have career and women should have family. You see, so much of what happens in our implicit association comes from all of the societal input points. We think we're taking in information fairly. We do. Unfortunately, 
even within that, we have discrimination. We just do. Discrimination, discernment. Am I going to have the chocolate raspberry tort or am I going to have the creme brulee for dessert? Discrimination, right? So let's warm up our shoulders, warm up our arms. Let's do a little IAT for ourselves. And here's how we're going to do this. It's very simple. Left arm, right arm. Left hand, right hand. You don't have to raise it all the way up. You decide what you're doing here. We're going to take about five minutes and do an IAT. In this particular instance, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say some words. If I say an insect, raise your left hand. If I say a flower, raise your right hand. Simple, right? Okay, here we go. Orchid. Wasp. Lilac. Moth. Roach. Tulip, rose, gnat. All right, how'd you do? Feel good? Warming you up? Okay, let's try a different one. This time, if I say a pleasant word, left hand. If I say an unpleasant word, right hand. This is round two. See how we do. Gentle, evil, damage. Enjoy, ugly, love, hurt, happy. Still crushing it, 100%, everybody's on pace. Excellent, let's elevate. This time, if it's a flower or a pleasant word, left hand. If it's an insect or an unpleasant word, Right hand. Rose. Weevil. Daisy. Flea. Lily. Daffodil. Wasp. Petunia. Okay, still feeling good about it all? I hope so. Those are, those are all great. Let's try one more. This time, if it's a flower or an unpleasant word, left hand. If it's a pleasant word or an insect, right hand. Orchid, moth, happy, damage, poison, daisy, cheer, centipede, Love, Rose. How'd you do that time? This is what the IAT is really doing, is checking on our concepts, our evaluations, and our stereotypes. And so when I combine something we typically see as negative, an insect, with something we typically see as positive, a pleasant word, your brain gets befuddled. And when I try to maintain, or at least I'm trying to maintain the same cadence of my words, then you end up in some version of, oh, wait, oh, wait, oh, wait. So the IAT is offering us that reference point to say, oh, on this particular issue, I'm collapsing things that maybe I don't want to collapse. Maybe all insects aren't unpleasant, for instance. I encourage you to play with it. I also encourage you to think about doing it in a small group saying, hey, let's all go in and do this IAT. As an example, I remember very clearly, I went in and did an IAT on whether or not I personally was preferring a female president over a male president. Now, this was prior to the um, election before last. And the reason I was doing it is because this is what I do for a living. I work with groups. And I wanted to uncover any hidden bias I might have about the audience. And I thought that end of the IAT would show I had a bias toward having a female president. And it was the opposite. Again, because my conscious mind and my unconscious mind are not the same. 
So the IET makes for a great conversation. It makes for a great opportunity for us to learn more about ourselves and learn more about things that we didn't realize we had collapsed. Now, another way to do this, something I put in your workbook, which is I am, but I am not. I'm going to pause for a second here to, to have you do this activity. I am, but I am not. If you think about, I am a woman, but I'm not a homemaker. I am a woman. I don't wear dresses. Okay. And when you start to think about the I am, but I am not activity, you start to recognize where some of the stereotypes come into play. Now, one of the things that Pam didn't say in the introduction, mostly because I, I didn't offer it to her, is that my first career was as a professional athlete. Hmm. So when we do I am, but I am not, and you, if Pam had said, we welcome Judy Hassan, former professional athlete. I am an athlete, but I am not. And imagine whatever stereotype you might have about that. But I'm not dumb, right? As we think about this activity, we start to uncover the things that other people might have put on us in that segment and slice below the waterline. I am, but I am not. We are really looking for the places where we make assumptions based on social influence. That's what the point of this activity is. So I encourage you to populate a few in as I've been talking here and, and then share those. Share those with colleagues, share those with friends. Really think about, hmm, let me be open about what I'm noticing in the stereotypes. And now when I hear yours, let me think about how much of that stereotype might have been from me. It's a really good activity. It doesn't take long at all. Okay. So coming back around to this notion of belonging, there's a huge sense of safety and a huge sense of being able to share your story. If you did that activity, I am, but I am not, and then you share it, you begin to share your story. Do you feel like you belong to your team? Do you feel like you fit in with your team? Hmm. If something bad happens, do you feel safe at work? Hmm. If I don't feel safe at work, I'm certainly not going to share my story at work, right? Something bad happened, so I will admit something bad happened this morning. I have a leak outside my house. Water is pouring. Plumber is coming after I get done talking to you. Something bad has happened. Do I feel safe sharing that with you? Yes, even though we're recorded into posterity for it. Do I feel safe sharing when something bad happens? Hmm. Sense of belonging. Do I have a work best friend? And I mentioned this earlier. This is... Um, this is really important stuff. Does someone care about me at work? How do I create the connection to someone at work? But when I have a stronger connection to them, I have more engagement. I have more productivity. I have more all of those things that feel good. The last piece about belonging that's really important is simply to say, how important is it to you? And if you're here today, because you have to be, because there's no doubt somebody who has to be here, as you're here having to be, thinking belonging is not that important to you, I'll encourage you to think about that's some level of privilege that you have, that you don't have to think about it because in Maslow's, hier Maslow's hierarchy of needs, it's in the middle. It's a really important component of it. So if you don't think about that and you're up there above that with esteem and self-actualization, if you don't think about that, that's a point of privilege. And I think it's really important that we discuss privilege, at least briefly. And I know I put some privilege pie um, in your materials to have you think about that differently. I wanted to find it simply this way. Privilege is unearned advantages. And we all have them. We all have unearned, we have earned. It's not, I'm, I'm not here to say one is better than the other. I'm not here to judge you for what you do or don't have. It's simply a matter that some people work harder to get to the experiences we take for granted. That's it. That's it. So a number of years ago, I attended a weekend workshop. And um, actually, I attended as the guest of somebody who had a free registration and it was going to go to waste. So sure, I'll attend. Um, <laughs> I was at a hotel and uh, in the middle of the workshop, the, the guy who was facilitating the discussion said, okay, you all have uh, 10 minutes to 
uh, go to the back of this huge ballroom where there were piles of clothes from Goodwill. So you have 10 minutes to find something to wear. Uh, here are the pants, here are the shirts, here are the shoes. Go to your hotel room, take off all of your valuables, leave all of your electronics behind, no watch, no money, and return downstairs in these new clothes. Okay, we returned downstairs, were put in lines outside the building and had soot dumped on us. From there, we were put on buses and we were dropped in various parts of town. Uh, that is an interesting way to be. We got dropped on these pieces of property around town and we're told five hours from now, we will pick you up at the intersection of X and Y. We didn't have watches. We, we didn't have directions. We just knew we needed to be somewhere in five hours. So my option for that was to wander and I wandered. I wandered through downtown of this city, looked at menus for restaurants. And when the restaurant was open, inevitably somebody would step out and say, you need to move along. And on the inside of me, I'm thinking, I don't need to move along. I could come back here for dinner tonight. On the outside of me, what people saw was this person whose clothes didn't fit that were covered in dirt. Please move along. So, so this, this really valuable lesson for me personally, having not experienced homelessness beyond it being a social crisis in our country is how much I take for granted. I knew I would sleep in a warm bed. I knew I would have a hot shower. I knew I would get clean. I didn't exactly know how I was going to find my way to the destination for the bus. That was my biggest concern. So that idea of what exists inside of me gave me some glimpse into my privilege. That's important. Think about that. Our privilege protects us in a lot of ways. In fact, eventually I just went and laid down in a park. Parking meters have time on them. So that was good news for me. So I went and laid down in a park and I had a gentleman come up to me and I, I, I smelled him coming before he arrived. That's all I'm gonna say. So I opened my eyes and he says, you are obviously new here. Please don't be here in another hour. You need to go to the shelter on the corner of X and Y where all the women gather. Again, it had never occurred to me that I wouldn't be safe. This notion of privilege exists very deeply very deeply. Cultures Connecting, which is a really great organization, has really narrowed down into privilege pie to say, here are these areas that are most common around privilege. Now, I just told you a story that's not as common. It's not about these things necessarily, although maybe it's about class, ultimately, middle and upper. What's important to note here, at least in my opinion, is a lot of us don't recognize the age piece the rest of these pretty common. I think we all know white, male, middle, upper class, Christian, heterosexual, probably even cisgender that are citizens and physically capable, physically and mentally able. Those are all pretty common ones we could have come to on our own. And age, how many of you are outside this age band and have feelings about that? That, that piece of it, really, really important to consider. As we think about where our privilege lives, I want you to think about, is there some piece of this identity where it appeared to hold you back? And is there some piece of this that worked to your advantage? And, and I will say, being a white woman, cisgendered, works to my advantage in some settings and not others. Being an athlete, works to my advantage in some settings, not necessarily all. When you start thinking about that and you do a little bit deeper dive in there, you notice the places where you might not be showing up fully at work. Where is a part, what is an experience where part of your identity appeared to hold you back? Where is an experience where part of your identity worked to your advantage? Hmm. Okay, this last piece I want to talk about with you, I call it dibs, diversity, inclusion, and belonging, dibs, these seven areas that I think are really, really critical to our long-term success. That's it. 
when we think about change, which, which by the way, I think even saying the word change, I'm not sure we're really interested in change anymore. How many of you even have a single coin in your pocket right now, right? We don't, we don't even want to deal with it. We don't talk about money change that way. So change is really hard for us. We, we've come up with new words, continuous improvement, innovation, um, evolution. Instead of using the word change, it's crazy if you pay attention out there. Here's what I want to say. How must I change if I want them to be different? How must I evolve if I want them to be different? Thinking for yourselves, how do you go about evolving your knowledge, evolving your relationships, evolving your conversations in a way that allows other people the space to come in? And I'll use that big word again, vulnerability. Can I come into a conversation and hear a different view and contemplate it without defending my view. That commitment, that commitment's huge. That commitment to say, uh, it's really important to me that I have a sense of belonging, therefore I want to create that for the people around me. And by the way, that probably requires some courage. Vulnerability often requires courage. Can I say something? Can I, can I actually ask a question I don't know the answer to? Let's, let's go back to that prefrontal and subconscious part of our brain. I cannot hold, my brain cannot hold both the judgment and the curiosity at the same time. So I, I, I say you can't be curious and furious at the same time. I can't be really mad at the driver in front of me and also curious as to why they just cut me off, right? Okay, okay, <laughs> before you blow up the chat, I know I'm not curious about why they cut me off. I just want them to go away. I get that part. We hope, I'm hoping what you can hear there is to say, oh, look at me when I've already decided something about somebody, I will have no vulnerability to be curious. What is curiosity? If you're struggling to understand it, simply ask a question you don't know the answer to. Ask a question you don't know the answer to. When you think about how you can learn about other people, you can do it by deciding, right? The judgment, you can do it by curiosity. When I have that curiosity, I use my vulnerability to go into conversations I don't know the answer to. Oof, it's difficult. I will also say we really like being comfortable. That's why we don't do more with any of this topic. How many of you belong to a diversity book group or an inclusion book group or a belonging book group? Ooh, some of those are hard to say. Article clubs, any mechanism by which you're going out, <clears throat> excuse me, to learn more, to gather cultural intelligence in a new way. Where are the places that we can own our own ability to change if we want them to be different? It's really, really important stuff here. When I think about, <clears throat> excuse me, the cultural intelligence piece, we touched on it lightly today. I put you through a very, very, very generic IET. It's up to you to say, did I even participate in that? Because understanding your own resistance, step one. And, and, and here's, I'll add this in, again, with vulnerability, we, we go through time and space competing with each other. And, and I get that part, that's ego. And by the way, that's also me as an athlete, right? I'm, I, any day of the week, and I'm not good at most sports, so there's that. that. That notion of competition, that ego holds me central to who I am. So when our egos get outsized that we end up with trouble. Back to the competition piece. So we have three things we show up with, three things, period. We show up with talent, I don't want to litigate against any of you. I don't want to have to file a patent. Nope, that's all you. 100% of the time, we're going to compete. You're going to win, right? We show up with treasure. Okay, pull out your checkbook. I'll pull out my check. Oh, goodness, I just sounded 80 years old. Pull out your phone app, bank app. I'll pull out my bank app. Somebody will have a penny more than the other. Great, we'll compete on treasure. Somebody will win. But those aren't the things we compete on, are they? What we compete on is time. And here's what's crazy. Time is finite. I have 24 hours in my day. You have 24 hours in yours. You're giving me one hour of time today. That's it. 
this hour you don't get back on this day this time never again right we compete on time by trying to out busy everybody else i'm busy i'm busy i'm busy i'm busy what's the message our subconscious communicates with busy and i can hear you all in my head right now that who you are is not as important as this thing i'm doing that's what our subconscious hears so imagine i've got a six-year-old in front of me and i say mommy's busy right now six-year-old hears wow whatever mommy's doing is more important than who i am not consciously it's not conscious folks so when we use that word to encapsulate all the things let's replay the scenario six-year-old comes in mommy will you come do this thing with me hmm i need five more minutes because i'm making fudge and i can't stop stirring until it's done now six-year-old doesn't have the same impact. Okay, take the kid out of the equation. Let's go to work. Go to work, what do we say? I'm so busy. I am, you're busy? No, no, I'm busy. Let me tell you how busy I am. I am so busy, I don't have time for book club. I don't have time to learn about all this cultural stuff. I don't have time to attend this webinar and be fully present to it. Wow, no, what you're saying is, my priority is not that. My priority is this. It, if we watched our nomenclature and we watched how we talked about time, we would be in a much different relationship to courage and vulnerability and commitment and cultural intelligence, let alone collaboration and confidence. Because when I communicate to you everything in relation to something finite, it is extremely difficult to relate to. Can't compete on it. Ego wants to compete. So if we can ratchet it up and really pay attention to how we reference ourselves, I have a priority of this. Let me get to you next, as opposed to I'm busy. We change the whole conversation. You want to learn more? You want to create more environment of belonging? You want to be more inclusive oriented? Find a book group. Read about people that are not like you. Read about people that are like you, but not you. Do that in increments. Don't consume the whole book. Read a chapter. Have a conversation. Read an article. Talk amongst a group. Foster conversation. Go into the SLW Academy with a group of friends and do one module together. Talk about the experience of it. Share it with the people on there you know that are on their career path that aren't even thinking about this other way of advancing career. All of these pieces of vulnerability create more confidence in us to do the good work, to do what's possible, to create commitment to belonging because we're willing to look outside of our own experience and we get away from our incredibly tight commitment to competition on time. Okay, covered a lot of ground today. Haven't seen a lot of questions. Wanna make sure that you know that's available to you. What do you think about this guy? What do you notice about this guy? Ha! Tell you what, I don't want to sit next to him. No way. Yeah, Alexis, he's about to sneeze and it's going to be not cute. He's got more Kleenex than I know how to get. That's right. I'll say it differently. This guy is contagious. I want you to think about every single one of you being contagious. We are all contagious. The question is, what are we spreading? What are we spreading? Yeah, he could just have allergies. Wonder what he's allergic to. I move through the world as a positive influence. I'm a positive influence. Other people feed on that and become more positive, right? Are your conversations, excuse me, are your conversations starting with you? Or do they start with someone else? In other words, I'm going to tell you about so-and-so as opposed to I feel, I am. So-and-so did something else. Here's the piece. The blame game, super easy. So-and-so made me such and such. Coming in and being contagious because you're starting things in first person, way more important. Accountability 
to learning and growing in this sense of belonging, the sense of diversity and inclusion starts with you and how you respond to things. So here's where I want to leave you. Covered a lot of ground today. I want you to think about how you will contribute to world domination for good. How will something in this program today make you better? How will you use this with other people and to help other people? And that's one action you could take from this conversation today to improve some situation in your life. These questions are not in your materials. These are questions I'd love for you to have conversations with other people in attendance today. Now I'm gonna clear it out for questions, give you all 30 seconds or so to pop something in or comments are welcome too. All right, then I'm gonna say thank you. Thank you SLW for having me. Yes, thank you. Several IATs, they're very eye-opening. They are great conversation points. It's really fantastic. How did I get started studying this? Hmm. That uh, That's a really, so I'm a member of the LGBT, Q plus community. And a number of years ago, I sat on a panel of talking about uh, LGBT rights in for employers. And this is before they were uh, really impressed upon the world. And one of the comments from one of my co-panelists was how the dress code for lesbians has to, you have to be sure lesbians don't wear dresses. And um, I thought to myself that, wow, I, I thought I was part of a community that would be aware. And so even within our marginalized subsets, we have people who have bias. That's how socialized all of this is. And it sent me on a path of learning and understanding and connecting into the group Cultures Connecting in Seattle, which is a fantastic organization. Uh, it sent me down the path. I'm, I'm currently studying to be a CDP, so I'm a certified diversity professional, to have understanding toward it. What are my thoughts on having an affinity group um, directed toward the community or people with disabilities? I think the significance of any affinity group is to have understanding of the community they're addressing, not simply a group where those subsets gather to make themselves other. Uh, we don't need more instances of othering. We need more, more togethering. And so if I have any sort of affinity group, I want to open those doors to allow people to come in and have conversations that are learning and growing conversations in ways that maybe we can offer the organization as a whole um, ed extra education, extra improvement, extra value, those kinds of things. That's what I think about affinity groups in general, whatever they, wherever they come from. Any thoughts how we can address implicit biases affecting the hiring process? Yes, a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, definitely go through, scrub your resumes, scrub them. Um, how significant, where's the first place you look on your resume? When somebody comes in to apply for a job for you, what do you look at first? And then notice what pattern you have by looking at that. If the first place I look is law school, hmm, that kind of implies that there's only certain schools I'm willing to look at. That marginalizes a whole other set of people that might be really, really talented, but economically unavailable to those particular schools. If the first place I look is address, because I only want people within a certain distance of my office, scrub address. What you want to look on a resume is our actual skill sets actual things that apply to the job at hand. You might not actually be able to surface some of the other really good juicy stuff till you get into the interview process. But really think about how you can remove the barriers that we create in our subconscious. Good questions. Good questions. Happy to have additional conversations with any of you that come up. Pam, you and SLW, thank you for having me today. I really, really appreciate it. Now, 
Let's go change the world one person at a time. Thanks so much, Judy.